But if you've got your Bible, turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I have been out of, in and out of the Gospel of John for the last month or so, reading and seeing that the Holy Spirit keeps bringing me back to it. And, and John chapter 6 um, is, speaks volumes to me. I don't know about you, but I'm always questioning the Lord. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Do you ever, you ever ask the Lord questions? It doesn't, it doesn't bother the Lord for you to ask Him questions. It does bother Him when you question Him. There's a difference in asking Him an honest question and questioning His faithfulness and His love and His compassion. Because that gets into the arena of doubt. And and I know we see it all the time. People say it and put it on social media and stuff and make plaques out of it and and say that that fear is the opposite of faith. It's not. That's not true. I can still move in faith and be scared to death. Pastor, you're not supposed to. I don't say I wasn't supposed to. I just said that there are times that I am scared to death, but I choose to move in faith. Faith is, fear is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is. Doubt's what paralyzes me. Most heroes in the natural will tell you when they're called heroes because they've done something great. They rushed into a burning building. They went over a ledge to rescue somebody. Whatever that, and they're called heroes. And you know, people tell them how brave they are. They'll, the honest ones will tell you, "I wasn't brave. I was scared to death. I was scared to death when I ran into that burning, burning house. Why'd you do it? Because I had to go in there." Because someone needed saving. Here in John chapter 6, to me it's just, it's a picture of what's happening in, in so much of, of the church and in God's people today. And it's actually something that really grieves my spirit. Because when you read through John chapter 6, Jesus has uh, been teaching and preaching for a day or two up on the mount. And it's hot. And there's no water for them to drink. And there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lake there, but there's nothing for them to eat. And Jesus looks at the disciples and He says, how are we going to feed them? And they look at Him and they say, it'd take a year's wages to feed this crew because there was 5,000 there. And... That's 5,000 men because ladies, sorry, they didn't count the women and the children back then. So chances are there was more like ten to 15,000 people that had followed Jesus up on the mount. And if they did bring any food, whatever they brought was long gone. And Jesus said, we're going to look at the disciples and say, we're going to feed them. And, and they're kind of like we are sometimes, what the what? Can can you? I mean, I, I can hear the bus now. We're what? What is Jesus thinking? We don't even have that much money in the treasurer's box. Judas has stole half of it. <laughs> and then they're probably thinking, man, somebody's going to have to sail all back across the Sea of Galilee and buy a bunch of food and bring it back. Who's going to volunteer? I mean, you know how it is. You know how we are when we're faced with a, something we're going to have to work. But one comes and says, I found a little boy here has got a few fishes and a few loaves. And Jesus said, that's enough. So I won't go through all of it. The context is there. But he divided them all up. He blessed it and broke it and sent the disciples out to hand out the fish and the bread. And the Bible says, everybody ate their fill. And then Jesus sent them back out to get the scraps. Now, when I think about this story, it's a, it's a big enough stretch for them 
to start passing out little pieces of fish and bread and thinking, this isn't going to get past the first row. (laughs) And then their amazement when they feed all these people and everybody's eating everything they want. Jesus looks at them again and says, now go get the scraps. I, I can hear Peter now. There ain't no scraps left. They eat every bit of that. Imagine how they must have felt when Jesus told them to go back into where at one time there was incredible lack. But after his blessing, he tells them to go in now and reap a harvest. Sometimes the barrenness fields can be blessed to be to produce the greatest harvest. And instead of a few fish and a few loaves coming back or a few bones and a few pieces of measly bread, they came back with 12 baskets full. How many of you know that will make you have a Holy Ghost party? But Jesus has taught them. He's done miracles among them. He's fed them. He's taught the disciples a lesson, he thinks. He hopes. And then he sends everybody on their way. And he goes, the Bible says, off into a lone place to pray. Let's pick up in John chapter 6, if you've got your Bible there. Verse 15 says, So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him, well, in verse 4, let's back in verse 14. These, you know something? I don't want to go there. I'm saving that maybe for next week. Verse 16. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. And it had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. So here they've had this great season of ministry, this great day of ministry, this wonderful time. Everything's just just looking great. And Jesus has gone off to pray, and other scriptures tell us that he actually sent them on ahead. It says... And when they went ahead, it was dark. Have have you ever been in a dark place that was familiar? Because you see, most of these guys were fishermen. At least four of them were fishermen. They knew the Sea of Galilee. They they had fished it. They they knew the currents. They knew everything about it. The Men that have been out on the water all their lives, they're, they're not afraid to be on the water. They're not afraid to be in their boats. But something happens when even in a familiar place, it gets dark. I, I know years ago working on the farm, I made thousands of trips back into the pastures and back home over the 24, 25 years I was I was there. And in the daylight, it was never a problem. Never. But at 4 o'clock every morning, in the summertime, springtime, summertime, early fall, when we had the cows out to pasture and you had to go back to the back of the farm to get them, you had to go back and get them in the dark. Oof. (laughs) In the daytime, it wasn't an issue. Because I could see. But at night, there's just something creepy about the dark, isn't there? I mean, is it just me? I mean, is, do I just, maybe the little boy in need, me needs to grow up, but there's just something, everything's spookier at night. I don't know what the deal is. It's just, but I mean, I remember getting on the tractor and, and, and going back and, and anything that moved or whatever, you know, you were just, and I know some of you deer hunters, you big brave deer hunters with your, High-powered rifles going out in the woods early in the morning. You got your little bitty flashlights. You are scared to death at every twig that breaks because you're afraid it's a panther, a mountain lion, or something that might be coming in on you. A bear might be. Don't look at me like that. I, I hunted with the biggest and the bravest, and I've never seen one yet that wasn't a little bit nervous going through the woods in the dark. It's interesting. Jesus sent them off in the dark. You ever feel like Jesus sent you out in the dark after everything was great? 
So they're sailing across, going to Capernaum, which is on the other side of Galilee. I've been there twice. It's it's gorgeous. It's beautiful in the daylight. I mean, in the, in, yeah, in the daylight is beautiful. At nighttime now, it's even prettier because it's all lit up. But back then, it wasn't lit up like this. And wouldn't you know it? Just in the dead of the night, a storm kicked up. And Jesus isn't with them. You ever been in the night and a storm kicked up? And you've been rowing as hard as you know how to row. Well, the Lord sent me across the lake. I got a word from God. And when you start rowing, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. But it takes longer than you thought. And you get caught in the dark. But the Lord sent me to the other side. I'm rowing, I'm rowing, I'm rowing, I'm rowing. I'm rowing. And, but it's, now it's dark. And I can't feel Jesus. I can't see Jesus. I can't touch Jesus. All I have had is a word from Jesus that put me out on this lake rowing myself halfway to death. I mean, they just fed 5,000 men. And now they're rowing boats. They're working at the word of the Lord. That's tiring enough. And they can't see Jesus, can't feel Jesus, can't touch Jesus. You've never worked for the Lord if you don't know that feeling. <gasps> Pastor, I can't believe you said that. That's why so many people bail out. They get in the middle of the work and they don't see or feel or touch. And they're alone. Feel alone. You ever felt alone? Tired and alone? It's one thing to be alone. It's something else to be tired and alone. <laughs> you ever been in a situation? Family, work, ministry, Health situation, crisis, the thing that just wouldn't stop. But you got a word from God. You're going to be delivered, going to be healed, going to be saved, going to be free. Going to see the Lord in the land of the living. All those, all those promises. So you're, you're working, you're working, you're working to get to where He wants you to go. And in the middle of the work, the devil has you set up. Here comes the storm. Worst possible timing. What did you expect? <laughs> I don't say that ugly. I don't say that to stick. I'm just saying that if the enemy's going to attack, if he's going to release something into your life, if he's going to come against you, if he's going to sink your ship, when do you think he's going to do it? In the dead of the night when you've worked yourself silly and you still ain't been able to get to the other side because you see, these are experienced fishermen. Just because the storm came, they didn't quit rowing. They knew the only way to get through the storm was to keep rowing through the storm. How many times have you heard me say, just keep on walking? Keep on walking. Trouble is they're not making any headway and the winds and the waves are kicking up and it's looking bad. I don't know y'all been there, but I have. When my best efforts, my most strenuous works, obeying the Word of the Lord, hit a storm. And it looked like I was going down instead of a cross.